Yeah. Okay. It's five minutes. Five minutes past start time. Uh, welcome everybody. Happy almost Hanukkah. <laughs> you're on. I, I can see your smiling face, and you're unmuted. Would you like to introduce Dr. Corin or? Yes, I would. Right, Tam. Perfect. Thank you. Thank. Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. I just, I've had the good fortune of uh, meeting Dr. Corn's family and, of course, him over the last few years. He has a handsome family, son and a daughter, and uh, here in Cherry Hill. And I want to thank him for coming on board this morning to talk to us. He is, uh, Dr. Philip Korn is director of the Cooper Heart Institute and the, and the associate chief medical officer of the Cooper University healthcare system. And he's here to talk to us, to us about updates in cardiology. Philip, thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you, David. <clears throat> thank you, David. I see a couple of my doctor colleagues uh, on this call, so hopefully they'll keep me in order. Although an ophthalmologist <laughs> is hardly a doctor, so. <laughs> um, if you can allow me to share my screen, whoever the host is. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks. Thanks uh, for indulging these technicalities, but. Um, so I appreciate you guys coming without bagels. Uh, I'm, I was going to have bagels delivered to you, but um, I figured that would be a, a little difficult to get to all your houses, especially those of you in Florida. But um, I think this is a, unfortunately a sign of the times to get together like this. I think the nature of our people is to really gather together. And this is um, similar, but I, I just, um, I'll, I'll leave um, some time for questions. But um, David had asked me to talk about something related to cardiology. And so what we thought we would do is uh, talk about some newer technologies that you may be hearing about or, uh, or friends or relatives might be uh, in a situation where this is an option for them or they're talking about it or maybe someone even here had a valve replacement or, or atrial fibrillation. So I thought we would talk about three topics and these are three technologies rather than just talk about the illness is to give you um, <clears throat> a little flavor. So first is something called TAVR, which uh, most of you have probably heard about. It's called, the, it's a transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. Uh, the second topic will be about atrial fibrillation ablation. And the third topic will be about left atrial appendage closure, or you might've seen ads on television for something called a watchman. So we'll get into all three of those. Um, we're gonna start with um, just talking about what an aortic, what, what is an aortic valve? If you look at this slide and uh, can you see my arrow too pointing or no? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so if you look at this is the a normal healthy heart and this would be what we call the left ventricle. This thick muscle is pumping blood through the bot through this valve called the aortic valve. And the aortic valve is normally uh, would sit right here. I'm going to let Michael Perloff in. Um, and um, the, Aortic valve, a healthy valve opens and closes, and it almost, it looks like a Mercedes-Benz sign. It has three leaflets, and when it opens and closes, uh, it allows all the blood to leave. Um, hold on, let me just, uh, Alan wants to get in. I know, I guess I'm the host now. So um, the, uh, the valve opens and closes here, and as uh, some people age, the uh, valve becomes thickened, rigid, and restricted. <coughs> Most people, as they get old, the valve gets narrowed rather than leaky. It can get both, but most people, as they get old, that are born with a normal aortic valve, um, the valve gets rigid over time. It gets thickened. You hear heart the doctors hear a murmur when they listen to you. They often will get an echo or an ultrasound. And what happens over time is that the valve gets more and more restricted. And as it gets more restricted, it puts more and more tension and pressure on the left ventricle to pump blood through a narrow orifice. And as that happens, the heart muscle can get tired and patients present with usually one of three symptoms. Symptom one is shortness of breath, which is the most common. Symptom two is angina or chest discomfort, similar to a blockage in an artery that people would get. And the third is uh, fainting or passing out. Once someone develops symptoms, uh, um, once someone develops symptoms, um, 
it's definitely time to replace the valve. We won't get into the timing of when the valve needs to be replaced because now we know that the timing is often before someone gets symptoms. So we know now that it's best to replace the valve for the patient before they get severe, before they develop symptoms. But clearly when someone develops symptoms, if someone develops heart failure or weakness of their heart muscle or severe shortness of breath related to this valve narrowing, we know that 80% of patients are, are no longer alive at, at uh, two years. So it's a, it's a deadly illness untreated. So this is uh, as bad as most cancers if it's untreated. The good news is it's easily treatable. So we're here to talk about some of the ways that we can treat it. Um, and uh, let's see, let's admit. Um, so um, some of the ways to treat it, and these are the traditional ways to treat it on the left. This would be a sternotomy or a big hole, big uh, cut through the sternum. The valve, the heart gets exposed by the surgeons and they put the patient on a bypass machine to stop the heart. And the heart is stopped, they go in and replace the valve. Um, we, we have a surgeon, uh, Mike Rosenblum, who runs heart surgery, who does is an expert in what they call mini AVRs, which is about a two inch uh, incision where he makes a small incision here and you're able to find the heart, find the valve, replace the valve through a mini incision. And some surgeons talk about a mini sternotomy as an option where they don't open the entire sternum, they just own, open up a section. More appealing mostly to women, uh, usually this is a bad picture, usually they make the incision a little lower so it's below the neckline so women can you know, wear bathing suits and you can't see it. But really the reason we're here today is to talk about TAVR. Um, so TAVR was uh, developed by, you know, most new technologies are done, are developed by uh, bizarre people that, pe that uh, whether you're Columbus or anybody else who has a new idea, they're often laughed off the stage. I think back about uh, when I was training and for many years in practice, we thought that uh, stress played a role in most gastric ulcers. And then we found out it was bacteria and the doctor in uh, Australia who first described it was laughed off the stage. Well, Alan Cribier in the 1980s said, what if we are able to replace the aortic valve without making an incision? And he was laughed, uh, he was laughed off the stage, but he fortunately pursued it and did it by himself in 1985 on a very, very sick older lady who unfortunately passed away after the procedure. But um, it was actually the valve worked, but the procedure was bad. It's the same story. The surgery was good, but the patient died. But that was his first case. And it was a patient who was very, very sick, who was not a surgical candidate. When he first came up with the idea, he said, well, what if we're able to do it in very high risk patients that ordinarily couldn't have surgery? And so it took, um, it took a long time because um, to develop it, but actually it was developed by engineers in Israel. So since we're talking to a Jewish crowd, I'll, I'll talk about uh, our Jewish connection to these things. But this was developed actually by a um, by a group of people in Israel um, with Alan Cribier, and the first hundred patient series was published out of Israel. And uh, the really the first case was in '85, but it took a long time for it to be commercially available. And we at Cooper actually uh, were uh, involved in the initial trial in the US with 100 cases. We did two of them, believe it or not, at Cooper. And then it took about five years for the, the device to become commercially available. And um, it began again in high risk populations that were not felt to be operative candidates. And then it, it, what happens in medical trials is that you do it in the sickest patients and then you move to the less sick patients and the less sick patients. And uh, currently, it's now pretty much first line uh, available in healthy candidates. There are, without getting into details, there are sometimes we choose not to do TAVR, and I'll explain to the, that in a while. Um, now, uh, it's about 300,000 cases they're expecting within a couple of years in the US alone, which is amazing. And uh, if you are investors, as many of you are uh, look to be mostly retired, uh, if you're investors in like the stock market, if you have Edwards Life Science, you've done very well. It's a company based out of California that has 70% uh, of the market share for these valves. And I'll show you an example of what it looks like. Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Abbott all uh, right now it's Edwards 
life science and Medtronic have the lion's share. BSX and Abbott are just coming out. With new, they have uh, some new valves on the pipeline. Um, we just celebrated our thousandth case at Cooper, and uh, it was exciting. This slide doesn't look like it projects great, but to give you a sense, these are the two valves that are on the market. A is the Edwards Life Science valve, and it's mounted. It's a valve. It's a bovine, which is a, a cow valve that's mounted inside these struts, and it's collapsed. And I'll show you a video shortly of how that looks when it's it deployed. This here is uh, the Medtronic valve, and it has these nitinol struts, which is a uh, synthetic material that's self-expanding metal and you deploy it and it continues to expand. So it looks like a longer neck. And there's certain patients that benefit from this versus this. Um, and um, let's go to the next slide. The, um, this is uh, when Shimon Perez was prime minister, this guy was the uh, cardiologist who was the first in Israel to do it. He was the one who ran that trial with hundred patients. Uh, in Israel, and he got a certificate. This is probably the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so this is a commercial video, obviously, but it, it, I think it's a good schematic of showing what it looks like when these valves are, uh, are, are deployed. The valves are mostly deployed using the groin as access. So uh, that's a beating heart. The example here is the heart is beating as this is put in, whereas the other technologies, the heart is stopped. Here, the heart is beating. That's a view of a restricted aortic valve that has that Mercedes look, Mercedes Benz, but it's clearly restricted. So the heart is beating. And then the video will show as we access the femoral artery, which is the artery in the groin, we put a wire up towards across the uh, aortic valve because uh, all this technology requires us to cross the valve with the wire. We leave the wire in the left ventricle, the valve ventricle I showed you earlier. Then we take a balloon, actually a big balloon, and we took to put the balloon across that valve and we sort of open it. We create a space because it's very narrow. We create a space, put that balloon in. It's called a valvulotomy, a balloon valvulotomy. And we take that balloon out. Then we put a larger sheath in the groin. This is showing the larger sheath. And through that, we introduce that uh, covered, that uh, the, the stent. It's really a stent, but it's really what it is. It's not a really stent, it's a valve. So it's a valve that's mounted on a balloon and we put it across that area we deploy the valve deploy the valve here you'll see the valve get deployed here we go it crushes the old valve and leaves the old valve in place so the old valve is not removed which was really the concept that everyone was like what you're kidding me yeah you leave the old valve in place so the old valve is literally sitting right here and the new valve is now uh in place and uh, is opening and closing normally. And if you look up in the top, it again now has a very nice open rigid view. So the metal struts around, and this is a bovine or a um, cow uh, valve. So that was, a, a, I thought, a, a good video to show what this looks like. Uh, let me see if I can get to the next slide. Okay, so what are the advantages to Tavar? The advantages to TAVR is that it is a less invasive procedure. There's clearly less complications than opening someone's chest and stopping their heart. Uh, shorter length of stay in the hospital. We actually send the vast majority of our patients home within um, a day. So believe it or not, you're in the hospital one night and you go home the next day. And what it appears that now we have great data on the valve durability and it seems to be similar to open surgery valves. So that's the, the real advantage of this. Um, so um, I just thought I'd throw this in there. It looks like he's gonna pull through, but he must have been a vicious attack. He lost a lot of candy. So we're trying to uh, avoid these kinds of uh, uh, attacks on patients. We're trying to do this in a much less invasive way. So has anybody in the group had a tavern or had anyone and their family have a tavern, just out of curiosity. Hey, Doc, can you hear me? Yes, hear you Bill perfectly. Bill Roth here. You oh, hi, Bill. Me, hi, you sent me to the Mayo Clinic back in 2005. Was it something like this that you're talking about? No, you had something different. I haven't seen you in a long time, Bill. I know, you went to Cooper. I'm still at the old place. All right, well, <laughs> we won't hold that against you, no. Bill, you had something, you had a, 
you had uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with a severely leaky valve, and um, you had an you had a septal myectomy, and you had a bunch of other stuff there. So no, you would not be a candidate even in 2021 for this procedure. Okay, okay thanks, Doc. But it's good to see you. So you good to see good one. Good to of, see you too. Who do you see in the office there, Fortino? Uh, no, I see uh, Deborah Sambucci. All right, perfect. Good choice. Well, anyway, so uh, uh, it's, it's a, a face from the past. But anyway, so has anyone here had a valve or know of anyone who has had a valve? Yes? Uh, Dr. Coran, it's Randy. Yeah. Um, Hi, Randy. I, I, I haven't, but I have a 92-year-old friend that had uh, the procedure done about two years ago. Yeah. And I, it, when they first said, mentioned Taver, I said, say what? Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. But but your explanation here was the best best explanation I've seen to date. It really put it into a visual means. And now yeah. I under, actually understand it better. Well, I think what's important to think about Tav, first of all, it's it's a phenomenal technology. Um, it, you know, obviously it works uh, for the vast majority of patients. Uh, talk for a second about complications, but um it's a great example of ingenuity of a scientist and how he followed his vision and how he's affected, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, from a from a uh, from a patient uh, point of view, it's remarkably easier than having your chest cracked open. Uh, sometimes um, we'll do hybrid procedures. So, um, as an example, um, if someone has some blockages and we would rather not them go through an open procedure where the valve is replaced and bypass surgery. Sometimes we'll put stents in the blockages and we'll still do TAVR. Uh, so we call those hybrid procedures. Sometimes these valves are now being expanded in use for uh, not just um, senile, we call it senile, or as we get old aortic stenosis, but people that are born with intrinsically abnormal valves, you hear about young people getting the aortic valve replaced called the bicuspid valve. People have in their 50s and 60s that neither of us sometimes will do them now. So it's, it's growing and growing. The complications, I did not put a slide in, but I'll just tell you the complications uh, can include stroke, which is the biggest complication. And that's the complication with open surgery. Imagine if you're pushing this new stent in there, you, you, you know, you're cracking it open, open while little particles can travel to the brain. Um, we do have a protective device that we use sometimes in patients that are high risk and uh, pacemaker. So there's about a, uh, depending on the patient, up to a seven to 10% risk of requiring a pacemaker after the procedure. So you'll hear about some of people who end up spending a couple more days waiting and they may need a pacemaker put in. So, um, you know, th those, are, those are what we, what we deal with. Um, I thought I'd move on to the next uh, sort of topic, which is atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, and um, atrial fibrillation ablation is, um, let me just talk a little bit about AFib, and there may be some people here familiar with AFib as well, but AFib is an arrhythmia. So we're switching from a plumbing problem to an electrical problem in the heart, right? So we had a plumbing problem, which was the aortic stenosis, and now we're going to something called atrial fibrillation. If you look at this slide on the bottom left, you'll see a normal EKG, and this is normal complex. So a little wave here called the P wave, followed by QRS, followed by T, P wave, QRS, T wave. And what that indicates is electrical activity. This little P wave here is electrical activity through the atrium. And um, that P wave then propagates electrical activity, which is converted into a mechanical signal in the atrium, then contract. And then it sends a signal down to what we call the ventricles. And so you have a normal activation of the atrium here, and then the ventricles with the larger ones. So the signal goes down in an organized way. When you have atrial fibrillation, what happens is you have a chaotic rhythm in the atrium, and no longer do you have a normal P wave. Now you have a chaotic baseline, and the atrium is fibrillating. When the atrium is fibrillating, what happens is it's sending chaotic signals down to the rest of the heart. Whereas here, you get a signal, goes through here and travels down. Whereas in this one, you have crazy activity, crazy impulses. And as these impulses go through and they hit this, this little highway that leads to the bottom, we call the AV node, this creates tremendous amount of instability. And you have usually very 
rapid heartbeats and irregular heartbeats. And that, that's what we call atrial fibrillation. So the atrium no longer are beating in a synchronous fashion. They're now just fibrillating. Okay, everyone got that, right? So this is an example of an EKG. I showed you a rhythm strip, but this would be what you see in a doctor. The doctor says, oh my God, he's in atrial fibrillation or she's in atrial fibrillation. What do we do? Um, and we have a, a whole host of things we can do for people. So we don't, we don't get panicky over atrial fibrillation, but we take it seriously. Um, atrial fibrillation here, you can see these, this is on the bottom here is what we call the rhythm strip on the bottom. And this is six seconds when they normally do an EKG. And you can see the bottom that is an irregular baseline and the QRS complexes are irregular, right? They're irregular, meaning they don't happen in a normal cadence. And so most people, their heart is beating very fast because they're getting crazy signals. And some people it beats slower, whether it's because of medicines or because as we get older, our electrical system, electrical circuitry is not quite as effective. So AFib could be what we call paroxysmal, which is once in a while, all of a sudden, you know, you're feeling fine and then you go to bed or you're just hanging out and your heart starts going crazy and it can last for a few minutes to hours. Uh, persistent AFib is a uh, relatively new onset AFib, but it doesn't go back right away. Um, so someone who has paroxysmal might convert to persistent and have it for several days. And um, we usually have to do something to get it back into a normal rhythm. Longstanding persistent is uh, somebody who's had AFib for at least 12 months and permanent is they've been in it for more than 12 months. So all four of these are um, categories that we currently use in AFib and they each have some um, importance on their own for us in terms of how we approach the treatment. But what are the symptoms that people develop? Well, symptoms, some people have nothing. They'll walk in and they'll have AFib and won't even know it. But most people feel something. They have a sense of, of fluttering or pounding. They might have chest discomfort. They might feel dizzy. They just may feel tired, listless, have less energy, um, get lightheaded and dizzy, either from their heart going too fast or too slow at times. And if it goes too slow, it can really be a problem because you don't get enough blood to your brain and you can pass out. Um, a change in exercise capacity. So you're normally walking a mile or two, and now you can't walk more than, you know, a short distance, short, shortness of breath and just feeling not right. So these are all sort of a conglomeration of symptoms. This is a slide just to show you that we, as um, when we see a patient, we we need to look to make sure there's not a, what's the cause? You know, why, do, why does someone have AFib? And there's a long laundry list of causes of atrial fibrillation from um, things that are not related to the heart. And I just point out sleep apnea is a big thing. Uh, undiagnosed sleep apnea is where you stop breathing for periods of time during your rest and your oxygen levels drop and your body sort of creates uh, your, your body's hormones go up and you can go into AFib. That's very common. Uh, and thyroid disease, um, and um, but the whole list of things. So valve disease, including aortic stenosis, like we just discussed, people have had long-standing high blood pressure, lung disease, sometimes stress related to surgery. You might've heard of someone having an operation, they go and take AFib afterwards, previous heart surgery. Uh, some people have the genetic predisposition to this. Um, and we don't have an answer. So, but the, the reason I put this slide in is so that you realize that when someone has AFib, we need to exclude certain things. So we go through a battery of evaluation to make sure that we're not missing something. And mostly, um, you know, the most common thing that we most concerned about is someone having blockages in the arteries, make sure it's not a reflection of a circulation issue because that could obviously be um, catastrophic. <clears throat> so what are the, so what you have AFib, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is um, besides having those symptoms um, is really stroke. Um, stroke is the biggest thing. So why would someone have a stroke if they have atrial fibrillation? It's because um, if the atrium are not beating in an organized way and the blood is not uh, moving in the right direction consistently, it can sit around. And what happens to blood as it sits around? It clots, right? If you have a cut, we, obviously your body wants to clot. If small clots form in your atrium, then what happens? 
that that clot can travel anywhere in your body. And the most devastating thing is if it travels to your brain, causes damage to your brain and gives you a stroke. So, uh, you know, that's a devastating consequence of atrial fibrillation. And that's a big focus of ours. If you, uh, if you or anybody have, uh, have had atrial fibrillation, you're aware of needing blood thinners. So blood thinners are something that are the mainstay of our treatment. That used to be Coumadin, which is a real pain uh, in that you have to take it every day and get your blood checked and can't eat certain foods. Now there's all these newer medicines that you see commercials for um, that you can take once or twice a day, Zarelto. And if you go, if we, we do is we have a scoring system and that scoring system tells us what someone's annual risk of atrial, fibr of atrial fibrillation causing a stroke. So for example, if you're a 40 year old male, I won't get into the whole score. If you're a 40 year old male and have a CHADS, you'll have a low CHADS vascular if you have AFib. Whereas if you're 75 year old male and you have a history of hypertension and you have a history of a prior heart attack or valve issues, or you get a scoring system. When that scoring system gives us an annual risk. Uh, and that most people on this call, including myself, if I had AFib, I'd be on a blood thinner, right? I'm 62. And so um, that's a big issue with atrial fibrillation. Um, treatment, and we're going to talk about uh, a way to avoid blood thinners in AFib, but right now we're going to focus for the next few minutes about some uh, newer treatments called AFib ablation. So some of the treatments, and you've heard of these things, people get shocked into a normal rhythm, and medications. Medications are, um, I like to say to people is that the more effective the medicine, the higher the side effect profile. So we use simple medicines to start and they usually work, but if they don't work, the more aggressive the medication, the higher toxicity on your body, including liver toxicity and thyroid toxicity and skin toxicity. So, so if there's a way to get someone out of AFib and do it effectively, um, we come up with it, right? So atrial fibrillation ablation, I'm gonna talk for a couple minutes about this. And um, this, is an, this is a view of a, one of our, this is like our EP lab, which is our electrical labs, a patient obviously on the table. And what they're showing here is a screen, which is a real screen that we use. And the screen has on the right, these are images with a, a probe sitting in the food tube called the transesophageal echo during the procedure. And these are electrical mapping. And I'm gonna go over what that looks like and how we do this. So AFib ablation, again, was developed. Uh, this actually was developed in Israel by a company called Biosense by some uh, graduates from Technion about 25 years ago. And the technology continues to evolve. The company was acquired by J&J, it's called Biosense. And they are uh, probably 80% uh, of the market in the world still for AFib ablation. What they developed is the electrical mapping system and the catheters, and so the hardware and the software that's involved with developing this technology. And if you look on the right, um, you'll see the bottom slide is, picture of, uh, is a picture of the catheters sitting in the heart. And we put catheters in the heart, and these catheters actually have little sensors, and these sensors send a signal like the top signal and that's a mapping system so it's an electronic mapping system and the electronic mapping system is developed by hold on this is what the electronic mapping system looks like and it almost looks like uh, a weather someone someone seemed to be a meteorologist on the phone on the call before was very into the weather this is very similar to a weather map um, and what this really is is an actual picture of the propagation of signal in the atrium. So those catheters literally sit in the heart and as they sit in the heart, so as an example, these are two catheters as examples that are sitting in the atrium. And as they sit in the heart, they're actually sending an electronic mapping system, almost like a GPS internally of your heart. And as it sends this, the reason for this is very simple. If we can determine the origin of atrial fibrillation, we can then zap it with a radio wave, believe it or not, a radio frequency wave and zap that area and prevent that from occurring. The second thing, and this is equally important, is if we can 
uh, eliminate this wave of propagation. So if you notice, like in this picture, you'll see it looks like it looks like it starts here and it propagates, right? If you could put a line in the propagation line, almost like breakers in the Jersey Shore, where you see those breakers out there, they break the waves from coming in. If you could wave that, break that wave of propagation with an ablation without hurting the paint, because you don't want to hurt, you're obviously, you're doing it with a beating heart. The person's lying there on the table and you don't want to put a hole in the heart. That's the big risk, right? So they developed this technology. There's all different kinds, there's cryo, there's heat, but this is actually with radio frequency and it's probably the best still today. So with radio waves, you can then create a map. And this is exactly what this looks like. They've identified, these are, this, these are, oops, I uh, got my joke. Um, the four pulmonary veins, one vein, two veins, we call these the pulmonary veins that return the blood from the lungs back to the heart without getting too much detail. And this is called a wave. This is called a, an ablation line. These are ablation lines that they put in. So the doctor with electrical circuitry is without x-ray is showing us how they move the catheter to different spots and they hit all these, they hit these with, with radio frequency and are, allow us to prevent AFib from recurring. And if it tries to recur, it helps reduce the risk of the AFib wave propagating. So two things, right? So um, if you look at the patient, they're, they're here on the table and they're mapping this, they're mapping this system and they're using what they call transesophageal echo to often guide them to make sure the catheter is in the right place. But nowadays, most of this is all electrical and we use x-ray, this is an x-ray tube here to put the catheters in the right place. But once the catheters are in the right place, there's no x-ray even used. So it's, it's really fascinating uh, technology. Um, and uh, you're gonna ask me which patients are best for this procedure. Um, and it's a widening indication. But the patient population that I first talked about, which is this population of um, on top, the paroxysmal AFib are the highest likelihood of getting AFib ablation and staying in atrial fibrillation with a greater than 90% chance of staying in AFib for more than five, out of AFib for more than five years. The second group has about a 70% effectiveness. And as you get to the bottom two, it's less effective less effective. So um, uh, we, we do AFib ablations uh, in major centers like uh, Cooper uh, in South Jersey would be at Lourdes and, and also at Deborah. Um, and also I think Atlantic Care is now doing them. But uh, in Philadelphia, obviously at Penn and Jefferson and Temple, they do a fair amount of AFib ablation. And Philadelphia was actually a big hub for AFib development. Um, one of my colleagues was president of Heart Rhythm Society, and she was a primary investigator in many of these trials. Um, but, you know, I don't know if any of you have had virtual visits with doctors in the last, uh, um, in the last um, year, but if you've had virtual visits with your doctor, you'll notice that your doctor can't do an EKG. He also can't uh, examine you, or she can't examine you. So I put this in there. Offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head, but just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests. So is telemedicine equally good? I would argue that it's good for a lot of patients, but some of the most obvious things that you see in, when you get to see a person in person, you don't get on the telephone. So I, I do believe that the vast majority of cardiology patients um, uh, benefit from uh, in-person visits. So is anyone here, since I'm going to take a little break, anybody here had an AFib ablation or know of anyone or have any questions about AFib ablation? Nobody, huh? Okay. Yes. Not an ablation, but I, I had AFib. Okay. And uh, uh, then I was wearing a heart rate monitor. I have one incident of it. This is, I guess, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. I was put on blood thinners and uh, uh, metropolol, uh, 
believed to control the heart rhythm. And I've had no, I, I never had the Chad's VAS score and I've had no uh, symptoms since. Thankfully, no, that's no, good. No AFib. That's good. Well, I hope it never recurs. Uh, the odds of you having a recurrence compared to someone else in this room who's not had it is higher. So there's it definitely, a, you might have figured out what the trigger was. Sometimes it's after surgery. I don't know if there was a trigger. Sometimes drinking a lot. We see a lot of, you know, maybe celebration, maybe stress, maybe aggravation. Was there something that incited it or it just happened spontaneously? It happened just before colonoscopy. Right. So maybe with anesthesia and the like. So, yeah. And I didn't even get that far. I didn't got in the room. It, it, it might have just been the stress. I don't know. Yeah, it could have been the stress. But what's your first name? David. David. So David's at higher risk than the average person to have this happen again. And the biggest thing is, did you feel it, David? Uh, I did not feel it before the colonoscopy when I had the heart rate monitor and I had to press the button when I felt it. I believe I felt it one time yeah. in two weeks. So the most important thing is to, to know if you have symptoms or not, because the biggest risk we have in some patients is they are have AFib and don't have symptoms, and that could be catastrophic. Um, there is something, just uh, you, I wouldn't suggest this for you, but there are some, but some people who don't feel their AFib because you had one episode, is there's a device called a link device, L-A-N-Q, where we insert, it's almost like the back of a pen, insert it under your skin and it's a, a three to four year monitor that actually tells us and it transmits signals. The other thing I tell people is to get a, um, is to get an Apple watch and turn on, if they have an iPhone, turn on the AFib detection system. And the Apple watch has an AFib detection system on it. And so even if you have, don't feel it and you have AFib, it will actually tell you you have AFib. It'll record an EKG, believe it or not, it'll record an EKG, a single lead EKG, and you can actually save that and send it to your doc. So an Apple Watch is sometimes very helpful. There's been a lot of, believe it or not, there's been medical trials on the Apple Watch. And the problem with the Apple Watch, you have to charge it, you're not wearing it all the time, obviously. But a link device is something that gets put in, uh, Lee? Yeah, hi. Um, But my oldest friend also had a problem with AFib. And it would be very close to 10 years ago in his uh, early 60s. And uh, he failed on the uh, procedure. Um, and he was going to Penn's um, electrophysiology department section. And he went through this. It was trying again. Uh, and uh, it failed. And somebody decided to get an MRI of his heart. Um, and what they found was a tumor in his yeah. head. And when they looked back at old imaging, it was probably smaller than the uh, head of a straight pin uh, on the first set of views. But it had grown uh, like a cauliflower to a bigger size. And after he had open heart surgery to remove his tumor, um, he needed some medication, but no recurrences. Yeah, so, so I mean, people have, like, uh, uh, there was a long list I gave there. Cardiac tumors is way down on the list, but uh, cardiac tumors are pretty unusual, but um, they can occur. We call them, Those are usually what they call left atrial myxomas, and they're easily removed with surgery, but um, that's definitely one of the causes. I will tell you that 10, 11 years ago, AFib ablation was nowhere near the technology it is today, and... Uh, it's clearly getting better and better. So the third thing I was going to talk about, uh, uh, do we still have time, David, or we do? Are we still good to go? Or? Yes, a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Right, so uh, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion devices um, uh, is uh, we, since we're talking about LEFib, we talked about the risk of stroke, and that was the CHADS VAS score. There's something we used to use, it's called the Hasblad score, which is a bleeding risk. So if you're on blood thinners, you're at bleeding risk, whether you're a skier who likes to do daredevil skiing and you're at risk for falling, or you're uh, an older person who's a bit unstable on their feet and they have risk for falling, or um, someone drinks some alcohol and they're <laughs> unstable on their feet, or a car accident or anything that may require, that may increase your risk for bleeding, 
Um, there's a scoring system we use, and some of it's age-related. Women have higher risk for bleeding, and um, occupations, th things high-risk occupations are in there. But so we have to balance the two. And uh, many of the people with atrial fibrillation are on blood thinners for life. So even if you had an ablation, um, you're on blood thinners for at least six months after, but sometimes depending on the clinical situation, you may be on blood thinners for life. But if you're in AFib, the vast majority of people are not getting ablation. Um, they're being treated for atrial fibrillation with medications. They end up on blood thinners. And the reason they end up on blood thinners is because if you have AFib and you don't know it, or you have AFib and you know it, a stroke is a devastating complication. So we usually balance the two. We balance with Hasblad and Chasvast, and we say, okay, what's your risk of staying on it? So here's, a, here, here's an option, and I'm going to talk about an option to get off blood thinners, right? So I'm going to talk about getting off blood thinners. How do we get off blood thinners? So some of the other issues are compliance with medications um, and um, other medical issues. And also these medicines are expensive. So here's an option to get off blood thinners. And I'll just briefly talk about this. You might've seen commercial for this. Um, it's called the left, what it, what, first of all, let me just tell you, what is a left atrial appendage? A left atrial appendage looks like this. Um, that's weird. So if you look at this, this is the bottom part of the, the ventricle. This is the atrium. Is it, do you see the whole thing or are you just seeing, um, are you able it's to good. see? It's yes. good, okay, fine. Okay, so the left ventricle is on the bottom here. This is the left atrium and this is the right atrium. The left atrium is where, um, is where clots form when you have AFib. Like we talked about earlier, when you have a chaotic rhythm in the atrium, clots can form in the left atrium but 99% of the clots form in this little out pouch we call the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage is, um, is really a vestigial remnant <clears throat> of uh, our mom's, <clears throat> what our mom gave us uh, when we were children. It actually develops early on and it doesn't go away. And this is where clots arise and typically sit if you have atrial fibrillation. It has no anatomic benefit. It really has no useful role. It's an appendage to just, you know, I used to always say it was like the appendix of the heart. It doesn't, doesn't cause much good, but it only can cause harm. Um, it kind of sits around, but if you have, if you're in a normal rhythm, you don't develop clots there, but if you're in AFib, clots can form there. So the theory is if you can, if you can exclude that atrium in some capacity, um, wouldn't that make sense? Wouldn't it make sense so that you can exclude the area that clots form and this way you can reduce the risk of clots forming and reduce your risk of stroke. So um, you might've seen commercials for the Watchman procedure. This is what it's called. That's with the company who makes it. Boston Scientific, they make one of them. There's an also a company, St. Jude, uh, which is now part of Abbott. They make one as well. Um, but the vast majority on the market now are Watchman procedures. So if you can put a little device inside this atrium to exclude this area, then it's uh, remarkable. And this is exactly what it looks like. You put a catheter up through the vein, sort of like with that AFib ablation, you go across what we call the atrial septum, and you go in here and you put this device in. I wanna show you, um, I wanna show you a video if I can bring it up. Okay, great. So this is just, this is not the video, unfortunately, but this is what these devices look like. There's a couple on the market but they almost look like a parachute. They're made out of, there's a PTFE, sort of like a, a plastic, a bio, um, uh, uh, not a inert, your body doesn't react to on a night and all platform, which is that metal platform, which I showed as part of the Taver valve. And it literally sits in the opening. It sits in this opening and excludes that left atrial appendage. And if you can do that and exclude that left atrial appendage, you exclude that area there are clot forms. And then eventually your body over a four to six week period puts a layer of cells over this and covers it. And as it covers it, it prevents that area from being exposed to the blood flow. And so essentially what it does is it reduces your risk of stroke almost to zero in atrial fibrillation. Um, so you put this device in and uh, 
within usually a month or so, we get you off anticoagulation completely. So we've done um, a, a lot of these procedures. Now we do about 300 a year at Cooper. Uh, the technology continues to improve. To, uh, they've come out with a new device called the Watchman Flex. You can come off anticoagulation. It's proven to work, and it can be done by cardiologists that are either electricians, electrophysiologists, or interventional cardiologists. So, so for example, at Cooper, we have four people that do this and know how to do it. And we're, we see that the patients are home the same day within 24 hours. So it's really quite remarkable. And um, the patients feel much better uh, off blood thinners because they don't have that risk of blood thinners. If they're on Coumadin, they come off of Coumadin. If they're on the other newer medicines that you see on the market, they come off of them. And their risk of stroke is almost zero. So who would be a candidate for something like this? Well, somebody would be a candidate. I give you someone we, who we, someone who might be dizzy and might be at risk for falling, someone who has a history of bleeding, someone who might be bleeding from their colon, they have diverticulosis and they have a lot of bleeding episodes and they wanna get a 40 year old skier who doesn't wanna have a risk of stroke as they get older and they have AFib. They may not wanna fall and hit their head, someone who is an active sports player, someone who plays golf with a dangerous foursome and is afraid they're going to get hit in the head with a ball. These are, you know, to joke about that, but there's a lot of people that just don't want to be on blood thinners because it's a lifelong commitment for many of these right. people and it's very expensive. So um, anyway, I'll end with this. Uh, it's good that you're eating more fruits and vegetables, uh, but be careful to chew them thoroughly. And that's my take home message uh, for all of you that take care of yourselves and, uh, uh, make sure you get your boosters and, uh, and uh, stay safe. So I'll take some questions. I tried to review three technologies that are currently out there that you might be hearing about uh, that might be interesting for you to hear about um, as, um, as patients and friends and relatives of people who have cardiac issues. I would like... Um over short personal story, it will take a minute or two. The atrial fibrillation, which I developed in my late 50s, uh, became debilitating because I have great physical strength, fortunately. And uh, I became quite weak, quite weak. So that instead of doing 20 minutes on a stress test, which is cruelty, but was inflicted on me by my colleagues, I could not do but a minute without collapsing. So a medical student of mine said that he would uh, operate on me tomorrow and change my valve, my aortic valve. I said, my gosh, um, let me ask you, could you possibly throw in a maze procedure? And uh, that's sort of a half-baked procedure, but they just open up the atrium and then just put an electric quarter in it. But he thought that this would be something he could accomplish in no time at all. So this uh, medical student, fortunately, I had given him a B in gynecology. I'm a professor at Penn gynecology and I gave him a B for him remaining conscious during the lectures and anyone who was unconscious got a C uh, so I couldn't do it the next day because I do did at that time a vast amount of gynecologic surgery so he said, I'll do it then the next day get your pre-admission testing he gave me the scrubs and stuff to eliminating any bacteria on my body. And I got over there at five o'clock in the morning. I said, well, what about doing minimally invasive surgery? And he said, well, I think we're going to do maximally invasive surgery, which he did. And um, I recovered quite well, but the maze procedure was a failure. I immediately went back into AFib and uh, although I felt somewhat stronger, uh, I then saw a gentleman named Furman Garcia. Are you 
familiar with Furman yes. Darcy? Yep. Well, he wasn't a medical student, but he's a good friend. <laughs> and he said he would do an atrial ablation as an outpatient. And he did that, and he was not quite satisfied with the results. So he did it again three weeks later and put in the Watchman procedure. That worked perfectly. And this was six years ago. And to tell you the truth, um, I didn't suffer much from the open procedure, except for the time in recovery and some rehab time. But there was no recovery from the Watchman and the atrial fib procedure. And I really feel great. I'm very, very pleased with the outcome and with the lack of trauma. You know, uh, I've always, I've seen many, many of my patients have heart surgery. They complain uh, uh, about th their recovery time. It takes them six months, eight months to go through rehab. Um, I, I felt great. I've recommended this procedure to, hmm, I would say, hundreds of patients because I've, I've presented this as a gynecologist in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Penn, so that if their patients had this, they could certainly arrange for their patients to be relieved of the stroke risk, which can be devastating. I mean, God forbid it, lands in the BRCA area, you have expressive aphasia forever, you can have loss of strength on one side or the other. All of these are vastly uh, complicating an otherwise normal or somewhat normal life. Um, I, I think this is truly a miracle what you have presented today. And I'm very grateful for the people that developed it it's, oh, that's it's great. well thank you for sharing thank you for sharing your experience uh with everybody because i think you know you're typical of the evolution of technology right so the technology has clearly evolved over the last several years um and this technology continues to evolve you know where afib ablation was years ago is clearly we're in a better spot plus we also know who we're likely to be successful on um, the other thing about it is that um, uh, this often combination. So I, you know, I mentioned the AFib ablation. The maze procedure there's, uh, is typically described. It was, a, it was a cutting procedure described during surgery. Now they have uh, improved that as well. Sometimes we'll do we'll, do, we'll still do surgical maze procedures on patients. And the data on the current surgical maze procedures, uh, which is M A Z E. Um, and it is a procedure done during heart surgery on the atrium from the outside looking in instead of the inside looking out. So th there is definitely, a, I, I presented you a little, sort of a little taste of our decision-making process, but clearly over time that technology is improving and continues to improve. And I think that they will see widening indication. I'm glad you're doing well, Dr. Nemiroff. All right, you're on mute now, but his biggest problem is he's got a shaky camera syndrome. You see, this is biggest problem. <laughs> That's his problem. He's, he's otherwise healthy, but his camera's shaking, you know? The room um, has benign essential tremor. Yes, exactly. There you go. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yeah, I do. Uh, oh, go ahead, Len. Right. You want me to go right. first? Yeah, you go first. You want me to go first, right. Richard? Okay. No, uh, wait a minute. You not, not you, Bill. You've already spoken. Hold on a second. I just okay. have a quick question for, for the doc. Yeah. Hey, doc, I see uh, uh, Dr. Belinger over at Penn. Do you know him? Yes. Uh huh. Rob Belinger. Yes. Rob. And uh, I have AFib and he wanted to do ablation. I was reluctant to do it at that time. So I'm on Zarelto, but I'm definitely uh, anxious to get off that. And I guess uh, this is certainly as good a device. And you're saying the watchman, they've improved it now. Do I, am I in a situation where I need both ablation and watchman or do I do one? Can you do both, both at the same time yeah. or? Yeah, 
So Dr. Nemiroff implied that he had both at the same time. Oh, he did. Okay. I think so. I think that's what he said. But he had a maze first, then he had. But no, uh, they're they're uh, typically not done at the same time. Although we've done a few at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of an ablation is that you're pretty confident you're going to keep someone in normal rhythm. So the idea there is that you may not need blood thinners long term. Now, if you've had AFib for a number of years and you've been in AFib, mm -hmm. you'd be in that chronic, persistent atrial fibrillation category, in which case an ablation is less likely to be effective. So you'd probably still be on blood thinners, even if he did an AFib ablation and if it was initially effective. So the answer to your question is, I would probably consider getting a watchman type procedure, um, regardless of whether you have an AFib ablation or not. Because this way, you can, if you really, if it bothers you to be on Xarelto and you want to get off it, mm -hmm. you look like a pretty young guy. So, you know, God willing, you live a long time. And that means you'll be on blood thinners for a long time. You know, it's hard to imagine, you know, we have plenty of friends and relatives that are over the age of 85, 90. Thank God, many are living a long time. And so the risk of bleeding goes up every year. And so, so does the risk of stroke. So it's a balance. So, you know, if you can get an appendage closure device, um, and be in the hospital for one day and come up blood thinners. It's almost miraculous. Yeah, I hate taking those pills. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely a good candidate. I think I'll give them a call tomorrow. Yeah, tell, tell them I referred you, though. you got to give me some credit, you know. <laughs> I trained at Penn, so I, I, I know Rob, he came after me, but I'm yeah. older than him. Gotcha. Okay, so All right, um, well, th thanks. I'm next. Dr. Corrin. Um, yeah. My uh, GP gave me a, a uh, check out up and uh, he said my heart for an 82 year old man is very good. Sounds great. My problem is, is that I become winded very quickly, pushing the garbage can up the driveway or taking a walk and things like that. Is this something other than the heart or is there uh, is it is it a heart issue? Getting yeah, but, very quickly. yeah. So, I mean, without knowing your story, like without knowing your medical history, it's hard for me to make a determination. But, um, you know, being winded, I say it's one of three things. One is your heart. The second is your lungs. And the third is the rest of your body. You know, you want to exclude a heart as an issue. Uh, lungs is a second issue because, you know, obviously your breathing is controlled, uh, you know, is obviously related to your lungs and lung function. And if both are negative, then we make sure it may be a deconditioning issue, right? So we may say your body's maybe less conditioned, maybe you have something else going on, maybe you're anemic, maybe your blood count is low, maybe you have some other underlying, maybe a thyroid's underactive or overactive. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of issues, but clearly the thing that when you're breathless that you want to exclude is, see, are you having, you start with a basic blood work and then an EKG and then a cardiac exam, you know, get, go, go see a cardiologist or a pulmonologist, but I would definitely start there. It doesn't necessarily mean you have AFib, but AFib can present with fatigue and exhaustion and shortness of breath, particularly as we get older, we become more um, dependent on what we call our atrial kick, the atrium working correctly to help us function. Can it be uh, that my body is in pain from my arthritis? I need a new hip and two new shoulders. So there's a yeah. lot of pain going on here. Can that be part of it? Yeah, I mean, so if you're if you have bad arthritis and you're doing less, the less you do, the less you do, right? The less you can do. Yeah. And so the less you do, the more deconditioned your muscles get, that your body gets. So it perhaps the reason you're short of breath, if everything else is negative, is that you're deconditioned. And you're deconditioned because you had suffered from progressive arthritis. You know, if your heart and lungs are fine, I tell people like you to get into a swimming pool or do some, some type of exercise that's not impact exercise that allows you to stay in condition without having to stress your joints. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is in reference to my wife. Okay. Uh, I do appreciate you coming this morning. It's been very informative. My wife is 72, and 23 years ago, when she was 49, she had an AICD uh, put in. And what, what, what happened is my wife was a gymnast through college, and we had 
a personal trainer that we had hired that we were working out with together. And the, she, the trainer was very, very much into the weights. So what would happen is uh, my wife was getting very, very lightheaded and I would continue taking her to the emergency room or a walk-in clinic and they would give her an, uh, an EKG and say, don't know. Uh, when they did put the a AICD in, her body rejected it and they had no idea why and they had to send it to South Carolina in California. And like every three days, they would send it out there. And for whatever reason, thank God, after six and a half weeks in the hospital, uh, they put the AICD back in and her body didn't reject it. And she gets checked up every six months and she's had no episodes. And she was, uh, I don't know whether you know of, uh, this goes back a while, Dr. Mazzola, who set up a practice in Texas and Brownsville and moved back uh, to the New York area. And um, he was one of the few electrophysiologist uh, MDs that, were, that could do this work. And uh, uh, what was really uncomfortable is my wife was moved around to three hospitals uh, because all the hospitals, and we were in New York, it's not yeah, uh, we we weren't in. Oh, I'm sorry. What what procedure did he end up doing on her? He took it down the defibrillator. AICD, you know the acronym. Yeah, for, I know what an uh, AICD is. Defibrillator, implantable yeah. defibrillator. He put in a different one. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, okay. He took it out. Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't put it in. Okay. Another physician put it in. Right. He took it out and put in the new one. Okay. The was new, it was it infected or? Gone. Was it infected or it was just not the right defibrillator? It, it, it was infected, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, listen, anytime you put hardware in a person, anytime you put any, any hardware in a person, they're at risk for infection, right? So um, we, um, when you put a defibrillator in, which is a totally different thing, you know, it goes in the, it goes in your circulation, it gets put in a pocket here. I'm sure many of you, it's like a super pacemaker with wires in your heart and that's in your bloodstream. So if you get bacteria in your bloodstream from another source, it can get infected. And so, you know, sometimes that infection could, she could have had a blood infection from something else. It infected the valve, infected the pacemaker, defibrillator, the wires, they all have to come out. Like you said, they usually, we usually have people sit for six weeks on antibiotics before we consider putting in a new defibrillator. Uh, it, you know, a lot of times it depends on why the defibrillator was put in the first place, you know, whether they need it back in, you know, sometimes we take out defibrillators and leave them out. Sometimes we put in uh, different types of defibrillators like your wife. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, 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 um, it's different, but she didn't have atrial fibrillation, right? Well, you don't know. Really, really. Uh, I was there, but I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly. She, uh, passed out, and she yeah. was clinically dead for several minutes. Gotcha. And because we were at Stony Brook Hospital, they uh, it, it's a medical school, as you know. Yeah. They had the neurology guys up every five minutes uh, yeah. to see if there was any brain function. So they didn't know why, yeah. yeah. And, and there, there was none. Right. So this uh, year, yeah, we, we call that an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, in which case... They oftentimes we'll put in defibrillators to prevent that from occurring. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that about your wife. Dr. Well, Gore? I just, yes. I, I just have a quick question. Uh, today, yeah. God forbid if it happens to someone else, would they pick that up on an EKG? Uh, I'm not, you mean pick up, pick up uh, which aspect? The, the, the electronic, you know, the defibrillation issue. It depends on what the, I don't know the details. Every a baseline EKG when someone walks in the in the office is only as good as that particular moment, right? And okay. there are some things that you can see on an EKG that can indicate your risk for developing catastrophic arrhythmias. But right. I would say the vast majority of time an EKG does not pick up people who are at risk for catastrophic arrhythmias. It'll pick up sometimes people walk in an AFib. 
Sometimes people walk in with uh, different arrhythmias. Some people talk, some people walk in and they have evidence of an old heart attack on your EKG. Some people have electrical conduction abnormalities that we pick up on an EKG. But without knowing the details of what happened to Mrs. Levine, Levine, you're a New Yorker, so you're Levine. So right, exactly. Without, yeah, me too. So you Mrs. Levine, right. right. Mrs. Levine, Levine had Levine. something that we're not sure. I don't know the details of what her, so I don't know if it would have picked it up. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you, doctor. Any other questions? Dr. Corin, uh, yes, just sir. a quickie. It's yeah. probably a vascular question, but uh, for a person who's had uh, superficial uh, blood clot as well as deep clot, uh, can that person uh, get off uh, a blood thinner or is that something a person has to be on for the rest of their life? So if you have superficial thrombophobitis, usually that's a local to the skin. It gets very irritated, gets very warm. It's very tender and very uncomfortable. Um, that is not something we usually give people long-term blood thinners for. Deep venous clotting, that's a different story, depending on the type. Now, usually the standard of care is six months um, from the time it's diagnosed. Then you have follow-up ultrasounds to make sure the clot's resolved. And usually you'll get some blood testing to make sure you're not at risk for further clotting, right? So there's certain testing that you can do to predict your risk for further clotting of the veins in your legs or developing pulmonary emboli, because that's really the biggest risk of clotting. The biggest risk of clotting is a clot can travel from your circulation, your vein circulation up to your lungs. So um, the answer to your question is typically it's six months. If you have recurrent episodes of deep clotting, then usually it's lifelong. And um, if, you have superficial thrombophobitis that's recurrent, you need to look for an underlying cause because it's not normal. You should look for something else that's causing that in your now, body. The, these blood thinners, obviously, they range from the old Coumadin to you know things like Xarelto, yeah. whatever else is. Is there a major difference between these yeah. blood thinners? Yeah, so uh, I... I'm a huge fan of the newer blood thinners uh, because they work very quickly. You take them and within an hour or two, your blood is thin as opposed to Coumadin, which takes three or four days. Um, I think um, it's, they're highly effective. Um, they're uh, consistently thinning your blood, whereas Coumadin inconsistently thins your blood. Coumadin also requires you to get blood tested at least you know, once a month if you're stable, but sometimes every week. Um, and it restricts a lot of the foods that you eat and uh, things that you do uh, that you're used to doing. So uh, green leafy vegetables and um, certain vitamins that interfere with Coumadin. Um, I, I find the newer medicines a lot easier for patients to take and consistent in their effectiveness. The only negative on the newer blood thinners is that if you develop acute bleeding, if you develop bleeding, like massive bleeding, to reverse it requires a, a medication that all the hospitals have now, which is a th like multi-thousand dollar medication, which Medicare will pay for. But um, it, uh, you can't just take vitamin K and it won't reverse, like which is, happens with Coumadin. So that's the only negative about those medicines. But, and the other negatives are expensive. They're like super expensive. And so a lot of patients run out of pharmacy benefits by a certain time, like October of that year. Um, and so they're very expensive. I expect in the next couple of years, the first one that hit the market was something called Pradaxa. And that'll probably go generic. You don't hear about it much anymore because it's going generic soon. Hopefully once that goes generic, a lot of these drugs go, will go generic in the next two to four years. Um, the price will come down. Thank you. Yeah. If you have time for uh, a follow-up question, I would appreciate it. No problem. It's David Singer. Um, so I told you about my episodes of uh, atrial fibrillation, and I'm on uh, Xarelto. It was sometime after that that the doctor suggested that for to reduce stroke risk. And he convinced, even, even though I'd heard bad things about Xarelto, my sister had uh, a lot of complications from it. I decided that was a good idea. And... Um, the only thing that I have, I have two things. One is I have a uh, 
a 15 month old puppy that likes to nip. And occasionally when I'm trying to get something out of its mouth, I'll get uh, uh, bloody, bleeding in my, in my hand. It stops and maybe not as quickly as it did before there's a real toe. And the other thing I, I've noticed at least over the last couple of months is every morning having some uh, bleeding from my nose every morning. Um, and I, I, uh, I don't know where it was, Facebook or where, I saw the Watchman device. I, I checked into it and they called me like uh, every couple of months saying, are you going to get to get any more information on it? Now I get my, all my treatment through the VA, mostly pen doctors for, for uh, as specialists. And uh, I, I think it's time that I check into the, into the Watchman from what you yeah. said. I think it's it's definitely something to think about. The other option is, I don't know, uh, without sharing with everyone, I'm not sure how old you are, but sometimes they can give you a reduced dose of Xarelto. That's the other consideration. You get to a certain yes. age and they'll sometimes reduce the dose. But yeah, I, I think a watchman is is a reasonable, but you're having sort of minor issues, not major issues. Yours are more annoyance. I mean, not a life-threatening bleed. So um, but yeah, I mean something definitely to consider because this way you'll get off blood thinners for the future. And the so, other thing yeah, I, I, I don't know if they're doing them at the VA. Most of the patients are probably going to Penn. I don't know if they're actually putting them in at the VA. That's what um, they did. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a fair number of competent people uh, there that would give you great advice, I'm sure. Well, everybody in the, everybody in the club knows I had a very bad case of uh, uh, COVID. And uh, they, it was right at the beginning. They didn't think I would survive. And now I've not only survived. I've gotten stronger and uh, the oh, doctors that are treating me said you can go back to uh, uh, powder skiing. So with, you, with your morning, I think that might be a good idea. There you go. There you go. I, yeah, love I have it. a question well, for you, great. doctor. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier something about insurance. Have you found that the, I don't know, let's say intrusion of insurance into medical decisions is becoming better or worse? Oh, that's a good question. It's loaded. Um, uh, uh, I think, um, I think a little better if I was going to, I think that there are a lot of problems with insurance companies that still exist for us as providers. One of my colleagues just the other day had a patient who clearly needed a heart cath and they denied it. He ended up on the phone for 45 minutes and it happens to us, you know, not infrequently where someone gets denied and some retired doctor in Florida is, is, is working moonlighting for an insurance company and adjudicating these cases. And I, it's very upsetting to us, but I think overall there's a, um, a balance between um, the insurance company and uh, doing the right thing for pay. Let's face it, insurance company is a bank that has your money and the less they give up, the more they have. It's pretty simple. Um, on the other hand, they have a vested interest in you staying healthy and well for a bunch of reasons, as they're now incentivized to keep you healthy. And there's a whole bunch of incentives on most of the insurance companies, particularly for Medicare patients, to keep them out of the hospital, keep them well. So um, I, think, I think we're also better at doctors at uh, documenting, um, using electronic medical records, it documenting the things that are key points for insurance companies to deny procedures. So if we document correctly, use the right key phrases and using the right guideline approach, which we have from our societies, I think that it's probably a little better, but it's really playing their game and not to, not, not to take someone's health lightly, but it's playing a game knowing how, what their buttons are and what our buttons are. Uh, it, there's nothing more annoying than being on the phone for half an hour trying to get a procedure um, approved that you know the patient needs. And the biggest problem with the insurance companies is they do not accept risk. We take risk, right? So we take the risk. If I recommend a procedure to you and the insurance denies it and something, God forbid, happens to you while you're waiting, that you can't sue your insurance. It doesn't happen, right? But you can sue us. You know, you can say, okay, you didn't do enough to get me the procedure or get me approved. So there's a problem there. But I think the answer to your question, I answered a long answer to a simple question, which is if you document correctly and you 
uh, communicate correctly, I think it's a little better than it was five years ago. I still think we have a ways to go. Hey, Doc, what was it like for a Jew to uh, go to Howard University? Oh, I saw your question. Uh, that it wasn't was great, mine, but curious. Yeah, it was a great question. Was it, believe it or not, we had, uh, we had, that's where I got in. You know, I got waitlisted at Einstein and a bunch of other places, but uh, it was a great experience. I had a chance to transfer out and I chose not to. Um, mm -hmm. I trained at the same places as all the Georgetown and GW students at BC, and it was it was a great experience uh, for me. It was a real. I grew up um, a yeshiva boy from New York. Uh, I went to, you know, yeshivas my whole life. I went to Brandeis for college, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know, so for me, it was a great growing experience. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions? No. All thank right. You well, thank much. you for thank you for allowing me to spend my time with you this morning. I'm sorry <laughs> about the lack of bagels and stuff, but uh, you're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Philip. We really All right, appreciate take care. So much. Take care. Very informative. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Be well. Thanks a lot, Doctor Corwin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gary. Hey, Dick. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, we're, Hopefully. We're, no one will have to see him or any of his colleagues anytime in yeah. the near future. Thank you, David, for setting that up. That was great. Yes, thank you very much. Does yes. he get a one-year membership? Absolutely. You'll talk to him because I don't know if he's still on, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's on. No, he's not. No, I, no, I do believe he left. Mm. Uh, well, guys, I, I, a quick update on Community Mits today. We're doing a hybrid, we're not. Uh, the Federation is doing a Community Mits today on January. That's a Sunday. And uh, Philip, that's Martin Luther King weekend, Sunday and Monday. I'm right, working with the JWV, and we're going to be collecting coats for the veterans, like, as we've always done. I'll be Monday at right. PBS. If anybody Terrific. wants to bring well, them over we, there. We will be Sunday at the JCC collecting food for the food pantry. We'll have a table in the lobby. The men's club will have a table in the lobby from 9 to 12, which would be three one-hour shifts. If people would start to about which shift they'd prefer, I would love to have two guys cover at least two guys cover every shift. You have to wear a mask, but we'll be in the lobby. So, you know, weather won't be an issue. They're doing uh, chemo bags are being put together in the building by students. And then there'll be virtual activities as well. We donated 480 packages of kosher peanut butter crackers as part of the effort for the chemo bags that are being compiled. And if we can collect food that Sunday from nine to 12, we'll be able to deliver it to the food bank the following week or they can pick it up. If anybody has any questions or comments or concerns, if you'd like to volunteer for Sunday, January 16th, sometime between nine and 12, let me know. Just send me an email and I'll keep everybody posted as to uh, who's, who's participating. So uh, a quick question regarding the JCC itself. Yeah. Is there an official policy uh, requiring people to wear masks at the JCC, whether it be in a public area or a non-public area of the uh, JCC? No, no, the, the posted uh, requirement is that everybody wear masks in the public spaces, the, the lobby, the hallways. But once you get to your final destination, uh, there is no mask requirement. Okay, thank you. I know, I, I, I've got my own feelings about that. Yep. Keep your mask on. No one's going to stop you from keeping your mask on. But uh, yeah, it's not required. 
Uh, Philip, I have to add to that. If you have not been vaccinated, you're required to wear your mask in all areas of the JCC. JCC. Okay. And yeah. I'm, I'm not sure exactly who's checking. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's more of an honor system that if you're not vaccinated, you should keep your mask on. But I mean, I know people who told me they weren't vaccinated and were in the gym with no mask. So Oh boy. Be it, be it as it may. But if you Anybody go to the, the one time not to go right. for sure is during the week, right after the school's out, because it's full of the high school kids. And who knows how many of them are vaccinated or not? Probably very few. Yeah, I I don't check vaccine cards, so I do not know. I'll happily show anybody mine though. Any have an event coming up, something happening, questions, comments for the group? I know that we've got an investment club meeting right after this meeting, actually. It was scheduled to start four minutes ago, I believe. Uh, Phil, when are we all yeah. going to get together and meet, meet uh, in person? Well, we've got a task group set up to... To, to work on that. And uh, let me see. I believe, Ed, are you leading that task group? Or you were just kind enough to put together the Zoom meetings? I think I'm the ad hoc uh, committee chairman. The committee chair on... on um, we, have a tenant, we have a tentative meeting scheduled for this Thursday evening. Um, at which time we're going to review that again. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the recent lose, news has helped us any in moving forward with a live mm -hmm. meeting, but obviously we have enough people on the committee that uh, we have all kinds of points of view. So um, I guess after the Thursday meeting, we'll have another recommendation. It might be a good um, idea. How's that, how's that for uh, gobbledygook? Yeah, yes, it might be a good idea, Phil, if you gave everybody uh, the results of the survey. Uh, we received seven responses. I think, it's, I I think it's irrelevant. That you're That's not right. I don't care. Of which I was only able to see 40, and we had a majority of those 40 who did indeed want to uh, meet in person. They were ready to meet in person. That is before the latest Omicron variant news. I don't know how that might change people's minds, mm. but right now we're shooting at a moving target. Yeah. So we will absolutely keep everybody posted. We have to mm. be careful. It's eight thousand miles away in South Africa. But never mind. No, no, they've they've got it's not important. Had, it's not relevant. You better update yourself, Mike. Hey, Rob. Yeah. yeah, I know it's not relevant. Yeah, Mike. Please, it will never go away. We have to hey, keep that in mind. Never hey, go away. Never. Hey, Mike. Go. If somebody has something uh, in, uh, that adds to your negative comment, uh, you should allow it instead of just trying to dust it off like nobody said anything. Sorry, did you say something, Bob? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm going to mute the. I'm going to mute the two of you in about a minute. So let's let's. No, that's yeah, fair. Let's Lee, let's give Lee, Lee. let's give Lee yeah, a chance. Um, yeah. I wanted to um, step back to the, the JCC enforcement of their own rules. Um, about every couple of weeks, I walk in the front door to either early morning or um, early evening, and sometimes on Sunday morning. Um, I'm never asked to show my vaccination card, and and that. I thought they were establishing a better security system, but evidently they and leave it up to self-control and self-patrol. And we already know um, that there's a, a minority of people that are willing to ruin life for everyone else to make their own convenience. Yeah, so we, I hear you. Uh, I do not disagree at all. And as I said, it's a moving target. We will keep. I, I thought I thought we had um, a member here 
who was connected to them or their security people who could have forthright discussions, um, you know, I'd be willing to, um, but I don't want to take it upon myself. Yeah, I know, I know Ed was having discussions with uh, the security folks at the JCC. Ed Silver. Yeah, sorry, Ed, other, other ES. Anybody else have anything to share? Any good, good and welfare? Okay. I, you know what, Phil? Let me let me jump in for a second. I'll give Please. you an update, an, an update on Barry Adler, um, okay. who, who was in the hospital about three weeks. I'm going to say um, when is back in Lionsgate in their uh, in their care center, and uh, is recovering from a surgery that he had. And uh, I spoke with him the other day, and he sounded good. Uh, I think he'll be in the care center a while longer, but uh, he's moving forward. So. If anybody has a chance to be over there anyway, um, or wants to see Barry, uh, I think they're admitting people at uh, Lionsgate outsiders. Yeah. So is, he in, is he in the rehab section? Uh, yeah, I guess that's the rehab section. Uh, yes. Yeah, that separate building, I guess. There's there, a separate, mm -hmm. yeah, rehab. There, there, are three, there are three buildings actually. He's actually a resident there. I guess you know he moved to Lionsgate. That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay. So oh, I have good and welfare for anybody who doesn't, doesn't know about uh, my girlfriend Elaine, who uh, had uh, stage one uh, uterine cancer diagnosed uh, in uh, October, I guess, or September. And she had... Uh, a full hysterectomy and some other surgery all at the same time at Cooper uh, um, four and a half weeks ago. And she's recovering nicely. Her, her surgery, she, she has no yeah. sign of cancer. And, uh, her surgery is uh, getting pretty much healed. But she's That's doing very well. Nice. That's nice. Good. Yeah. Wonderful news. I have good and welfare too. Yeah, sure, Alan. October 30th, my daughter gave birth to a baby boy. I'm now a Zadie. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, Congratulations. Yeah, it's mazel hey, nice David, I just had, through my son, Evan, I just had my third grandchild. She's known as Rebecca May. So I'll give you some good news, too. <laughs> Congratulations. Congrat Congratulations. I'm going to see him in Tampa in December. Very nice. Yeah. Well, with held them up. I mean, I guess that means you all are getting older. So no. boy, are we ever. <laughs> I'm uh, already up I, there. <laughs> my wife wants me to announce we adopted a dog. <laughs> Peter hey, my, gra the building. my grandson Adorable. got into, got into Delaware. So that's good. <laughs> Might as well tough on that. Okay. Very good, gentlemen. We've got an uh, investment club meeting coming up, so feel free to jump onto that. And everyone else, have a very, very happy Hanukkah. Thank, Thank you. you. Same to you. Thank Enjoy you. a latke for me. And, uh, hey, Phil, will... Don, Phil, Don wanted yes. to talk to me for a second after the meeting, so just leave it run for a second. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll leave it on. Bill, one quick yes. quick question. Ed Stein, what yes. time's that meeting on Thursday? 730. 7 7.30. 7.30? email went out. I couldn't find it, as usual. <laughs> yeah. 7.30, you think? Dick, if I see it, I'll forward it to you. Okay. I thought it was 7.30, but I'm not sure. It's usually 7.30, yeah. Is it? Okay, good. You don't have to send it, though. So. Okay. Good deal. Nice meeting. Good job, Phil. Be well. well. Bye -bye. Good job. Take care. Happy day. Sonic, Happy. everybody. Uh, Zag is it. Lots of you in January. Lots of you in January. Ed, if you could send that email to me. I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah me too, Ed. <laughs>